and in guarding the truth and being on the side of the truth, it is important that we remember to be on the right path. And we discuss that in verses 1 and 2. And then to be mindful of the resources our God has given us in Christ Jesus. And that's really where we are right now. Let's look at verses 2 through 4. Let's read those together. Grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord seeing that his divine power has granted to us everything pertaining to life and godliness through the true knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and excellence. For by these he has granted to us his precious and magnificent promises, so that by them you may become partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world by lust. So let's ask a question this morning as we reflect on the tail end of this passage that we have read. That we, jumping into the middle of the verse, verse 4, so that by them, the precious and magnificent promises, you may become partakers of the nature, of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world by lust. And we make note of a question this morning. Can you... Can humanity become something more or other than what it is? According to evolutionary theory, we can, because according to to evolutionary theory, naturalistic, atheistic uh, materialism, evolutionary theory, we are always progressing, and we are always moving up the chain of being. Now, I know there are those who, who hold to the idea that Uh, something will happen and wipe out human beings but that's okay because the lower life forms will take over and they'll simply continue to progress and evolve and all of that and if that's the case and that's supposedly their attitude I'm not sure uh, why they get so upset with certain things going on in the world or perceived things and I think it's because there's this idea that we should be more than what we are or other than what we are. There is Eastern or New Age religion, uh, pantheism, right, or panentheism. The difference is, is slight. Pantheism is creation, or what we see around us is one with the creator. Panentheism is, in a sense, an extension of the creator. So there are both of those views that are prevalent uh, prevalent in in world views today. All of them, that is all world views, have their view of what the universe is all about, what is its purpose, how it all started, uh, where we are headed. Uh, There's this search for the unification of everything and an explanation perhaps more, even more fundamental, an explanation for everything. The problem, human active, uh, humanity actively seeks to be something more than what it is. Humanity seeks to be something more than what it is. Uh, first of all, by embracing imminence, that is, nearness, here on the creaturely level. Uh, for them, all things are made to be one. If you were to speak to the average Hindu or somebody who embraced Eastern philosophy, they would say everything is one, and any distinctions you think you see or experience are merely illusion, maya, or illusion. So God is the same as creation, or creation is an extension of God, panentheism. And we gave those examples earlier, Hinduism and New Age. But let me me, uh, suggest something else as well in terms of, of even those who embrace evolutionary thought. They will often say something about how the universe responds to us. 
or if the universe wills for a certain thing to take place. Or some will say, well, the universe spoke to me, right? But the obvious question becomes, well, how can something that is material, inorganic, with no purpose, no rhyme or reason, that was all an accident, how can it do anything? And so people will often attribute human characteristics to inanimate objects and to the universe. And we'll say things like that. And sometimes we gloss over it and don't even consider what that really means. And I think we need to be alert to that sort of thing. So humanity actively seeks to be something more than what it is, secondly, by embracing transcendence. <clears throat> That is, to embrace a higher plane or level of existence. There is something more, and through perhaps meditation or whatever it might be, that I might attain to a higher level of being. E even in, even in uh, evolutionary thought, again, the idea of progress and becoming something more than what we are. There is that idea behind it. And of course, the great fear of artificial intelligence and, and somehow the combination of humanity and, and artificial intelligence. And is that the next step of our evolutionary uh, progress and those kinds of things? It's all something to, to get humanity something other than what it is. And it will never happen. That is, it will never become something more than what we are, than what God created us to be. God, in this case, of those who are seeking transcendence, Hinduism, etc., uh, is the highest order of being on the scale of being. God should never be viewed in, in their idea, God should never be viewed in terms of, of someone personal and someone who is apart or different from creation. And so you have a scale of being, you have a scale that goes from the lower life forms all the way up, humanity, and then God who is simply on that same continuum. And unfortunately, there are those who hold it in terms of religious view, Latter-day Saints, Mormonism, uh, the more popular word associated with it, Mormonism. Uh, they believe that, that uh, as God is, humanity can become. And at what we are, God once was. And he traversed this scale of being, this whole idea that that we are earthly, eminent, and right here, and we can somehow, somehow transcend something other than what we are. Even naturalistic evolution, secularism, thinks that same kind of thing. The emphasis upon humanism and progress and becoming something more, something better, that's, that's a, a stretch for transcendence for being something other, but always remaining connected somehow to creation, the earthly, and moving up the chain of being is our only chance. I put transcendence in quotes because it is something that um, we will never attain. We will never obtain true transcendence. We will always be creaturely, always. We will be creaturely in the intermediate state, and we will be creaturely in the new heaven and new earth and the fullness thereof. Well, beloved, there is nothing new under the sun. That's found in Ecclesiastes uh, chapter 1. Oops, it didn't. Uh, there it is. That which has been is that which will be. And that which has been done is that which will be done. So there is nothing new under the sun. 
the mentality of the world, whatever worldview it is, whatever system it is, uh, grew out of that which started in the garden. Grew out of that which started in the garden. First of all, in which appeal is made to transcendence by an eminent or earthly creature. So within that discussion between the serpent and Eve, you find these things being teased out. There is an appeal to ultimate authority. Oh, the only reason why God forbids you to eat of that fruit is because he knows you will be like him in that day. Not just comparatively, not just as image bearers, and you have to get that. It, it has to be clear in your mind. Because humanity, Adam and Eve, were already like God. They were image bearers, created in his image as image bearers. They could mature and grow and so forth, but they could never become something more than what they were. They were finite beings. So there is an appeal to ultimate authority. You can become something more, and with that ultimate authority comes autonomy. That you can decide for yourself what is good and what is evil. That's the whole, that's the whole issue behind the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Not just, oh, if I eat it, I'll be able to serve God better because I'll know more about what is good and what is evil. No, God was perfectly willing to teach them all of that. But they wanted to go around God and usurp his place. And you have to get that. You have to understand that because that fuels everything else that we see going on in the world today. And so there's an appeal to, to, to autonomy, self-law, self-rule. I can determine for myself the good and the evil. And there's, with that then, you see they all fit together, one right after another, so then I can be self-determined. That poem, I don't remember who wrote it, I am master of my fate, right? Captain of my soul. Well, I am not. I am a creature. And I need to view myself in relation to the creator all the time. And to maintain that creator-creature distinction. Creator-creature distinction. Self-determination. Self you are sovereign. You get to decide. And you make of yourself something rather than God making yourself something. See, that idea, that, that worldview, you see it permeates throughout. You've got to make something of yourself. Instead of, you really need to know your creator, the Lord God Almighty, who sent his son Jesus Christ and let him make something of you. Because he is the one who gifted you, created you, sustained you, gave you life, all of that. And in him you find your identity. In him you find your purpose and so on. When you sidestep that, you cut it all off and you are seeking something other than what you are. Any approach is an echo of the garden, and I mentioned it, in which is sought the erasure of the creator-creature distinction, secondly. See, in which one may be like God. That was an offer. That was an offer of transcendence from the serpent to the creature. A fellow creature offering that to another creature through the serpent. and in which good and evil are known for oneself in the created order, eminence. How I live my life self-determined self -determined, through autonomous functioning where I determine what is good and what is evil. Now, all of that 
to ask a question this morning. What is Peter getting at in 2 Peter 1 4? Let's get that verse there. You probably have it right there. Seeing that his divine power has granted to us everything pertaining to life and godliness through the true knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and excellence. For by these, his glory and excellence, he has granted to us his precious and magnificent promises so that by them you may become partakers of the divine nature. What we have been discussing is a corruption of that phrase through humanism, evolution, Mormonism, uh, Far Eastern philosophy and religion, uh, secular philosophy, whatever it might be, having escaped the corruption that is in the world by lust. Right? So that by them you may become partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world by lust. How do I escape? How do I become something more than what I am, you see? A corruption of the truth. A corruption of the truth. Develop, develop an ear for it. In conversation, as you watch something, listen to something, whatever it might be, develop an ear for, for hearing what they are saying, which is ultimately a reflection of what they truly believe in life. And may God grant you an opportunity then to share the truth and defend the truth. So the question arises, isn't Peter siding with these others? Well, there are those who say, yes, he is. And we need to set the record straight here. Wouldn't it mean that P Peter is saying that we become divine in some way ourselves, that you become partakers of the divine nature? New Age thought, we are our own little gods running around on the world. The key for us is to think of the word partaker. It's related to the word koinonia, right? Fellowship, participation. So the partaker is a sharer or participant, not that that person becomes divine. Not that the person transforms somehow into divinity. Not some sort of metamorphosis that comes about and changes us into the very nature of divine. The creature will remain, the creature will remain the creature. He will never become something more than what he is. And it is very vital that we understand that. And remember, being finite is not a sin. Sometimes in a fallen world, people will mistake their finiteness. I should have known a particular thing, whatever it might be. Well, why is that? Because you think you should know everything? That you think you should be able to plan for every little contingency, every little thing that comes about in life? No, but as believers, we trust in our sovereign God who works in providence, who does control history, who does map the course of the universe, and everything abides by his word, and he holds it all together. So we can trust the events of life. Remember, the ups and the downs. When life gets difficult, it's very hard. It's very trying. That's why we have discussed at length the need for what? Perseverance, endurance. I think every biblical writer addresses uh, endurance, perseverance in some way, shape, or form. It is needful. It is needful. Are there ways we never share in who God is? Well, that's an easy question, right? Are there ways we never share? Yes, there are ways we never share in who God is. 
a little bit of uh, doctrinal study here, what many theologians call the incommunicable attributes, those things that cannot be communicated to us as creatures, cannot be given to us as creatures. We say that God is independent. He has need of nothing. If you hear somebody say, well, God needed the fellowship of creation. Red flag, no. God did not need the fellowship of creation, therefore he created us. He did not need that. He did not need it. He is independent, self-contained. Ase is the more technical way of saying it. He is independent. God never changes. Technically, we say he is immutable. Are there nuances to things in terms of the development of space, time, and though yes, but in terms of who he is as God and his character and those essential attributes, there is no change. There is no change, and that is very crucial for us as creatures because what happens to we as creatures or to us as creatures? We change all the time. In fact, there are philosophical arguments that go on and say, are you the same person at 75 as you were at 1? Some will say, no, you're an entirely different person. Some will say, no, there's got to be continuity there. And they go back and forth, back and forth. There is none of that with God. He is immutable. How about this? God did not have a beginning, nor does he have an ending. He is infinite. Are you infinite? No, not in any way, shape, manner, or form. We are so limited. I don't know what's going on in Africa right now, and even if I was Skyping somebody in Africa, I would still not know everything that's going on at every moment in every household and out in the woods and all the stuff. Go it's just impossible. We are finite. God is infinite. And he does not share that with us. And then we say God is a unity and he is simple. God is not a simple ten, as often that word is used. No. That means he is one. He is one. He has, there are no parts. We have arms, legs, feet, hands, heads, so on and so forth. God has none of that. Are there ways we share in who God is? Yes, and I think that's what Peter is getting at. Partakers of the divine nature. It is in those communicable attributes. And one of those is knowledge. Knowledge. God's thoughts are higher than ours, right? Well, I won't get into it all lest we're here all day. God knows more. The extent of his knowledge is far greater than us. But there's another quality about his knowledge. It is creative and, and a standard and so on. So we can say that though God's thoughts are higher than our thoughts, yet the objects of thought are the same. If you are outside in your in your flower garden or whatever you have and you see the rose growing there and you think, I'm thinking about this rose. God can look at that and he is thinking about the rose. That is, the object is the same. He doesn't call it something else. The object is always the same. The standard of thought is the same. Quiz. What is the standard of thought? If it's the same, what is the standard of thought? Is it yours? Is it God's? Or is it something else? You're not too anxious to speak. Whose standard? Well, God's standard, right? God is the standard of our thinking. We are to think his thoughts after him. 
We're not to try and create independent thoughts of our own that try to explain what's going on in the world. No, we think his thoughts after him. His thoughts are the standard. And so God's knowledge is back of everything. God is. God is. And his knowledge must be to make sense of anything in creation. To make any sense of creation and what's going on in the world, God has to have, his thought has to be the standard. And we grow in our understanding as we know him. All wisdom and knowledge are deposited in who? In Jesus Christ. And so Peter directs us to where? Verse 2 in the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. Verse 3, through the true knowledge of him who called us. Do you want to know? You need to know him. You need to know him. Not just facts about him, but you need to know him. You need to have a relationship with him. Then you will begin to truly know as you ought to know. So what does it mean to partake or share in the divine? The ways that we share in who God is. We share in God's name too, beloved. We do not, however, share in his glory. We cannot share in his glory, lest God abdicate his throne. He does not share his glory with another. Isaiah 42, 8. I am the Lord. He uses his name Yahweh, covenant God. I am Lord, sovereign Lord. I will not give my glory to another, nor my praise to graven images. He, he cannot share his glory. However... He does share his goodness. He shares his goodness. Part of that, when we looked at his name another time, he is compassionate, merciful, gracious, uh, long-suffering, abounding in loving kindness, keeping loving kindness and truth and all of that. We get to share in that. He doesn't make us something more than what we are, but he makes us what, we, what he intended for us to be as human beings. We share in his character. So in terms of God, we can say God is love. The Bible says that, so we can say that, right? Now, can I say that of any of you? Rachel is love. Grace is love. Roe is love. Can I? You should be shaking your head no. No. We love because he first loved us. But we share in that. So Rachel, Grace, Roe can be loving. And they can love because God first loved them. And they know what Jesus did in a great act of love on the cross. And they can do the same kind of thing. They can love others. You all can because of who God is. And we share in his character. Sharing in the divine nature then Peter says, <clears throat> allows for an escaping of corruption. Allows for an escaping of the corruption that is in the world. Right? That last phrase, having escaped the corruption that is in the world by lust. You don't have to live any, you are able not to sin in Christ. 
Sin, Paul says in Romans 6, does not have to reign in your members. So even now, so both now, in terms of practical application, forgiveness of sins, you are given the strength and ability to escape the corruption that is in the world by lust, remembering that sin seeks to deceive and entrap and enslave and destroy and kill. And because of renewal in our lives now, corruption in the world can only go so far. So now we escape. Beloved, that's part and parcel of what God has done for us in Jesus Christ. You are not slaves of your fleshly members. You are not slaves of sin. You do not have to yield to sin in your life. We do, right? But we do not have to. We escape because of Jesus Christ and through him. And life can grow in a greater reflection of who Jesus is. You can mature in the faith. However, it is not complete now, is it? Because we live in these mortal, corrupted bodies. So that's why it allows for an escaping of corruption in the future as well. In terms of the, what is called the eschaton, eschatology, study of last things, eschaton, last time, the final event in God's plan. In that day, corruption will be fully removed from all of creation. And we're going to have an interesting time of it when we get to 2 Peter chapter 3 and Peter talks about uh, the elements being destroyed with intense heat and so on and what that means to us, what that means for creation. I, I think, well, at least in terms of how I used to view things, it means something other than what I used to think. And that's the point. And so, beloved, just as an aside, it is not, <clears throat> Paul said, I'd rather depart and be with Christ. That is far better, right? And we'll be in the Lord's presence. But that's the intermediate state. That's not the final state. So there's, so there's an appreciation for after this life, after I am gone, I get to be in the Lord's presence, and that's great. But far greater still is the end when all things are renewed and we also will look at what Peter means when he says we're looking forward to a new heavens and new earth in which righteousness dwells. When corruption is no more. You see, that's what we look forward to. And we read in the book of Revelation, what do they say? They're in the presence of God, but what do they say? How long, O oh Lord? How long? There's this being satisfied yet not quite satisfied. I, I don't know how to explain it because it's beyond us, and I haven't experienced the intermediate state yet. And then if I do, I can't communicate it to you. So there's this joy and privilege and greatness of that time, but an even far greater time at the end when God completes everything in Christ. And corruption will be totally rooted out to be no more. Can humanity become something more or other than what it is? Yes, if by that you mean growth and maturity in Christ, in knowledge, 
in goodness and in our character. No, if, you, if by that you mean humanity can become something other than it is. <coughs> and in this, God grants us a powerful purpose. <coughs> Our Father in heaven, thank you for your word. Lord, for what you teach us, for what you show to us, for what you demonstrate to us. We are in awe of all that you have accomplished in Christ Jesus. We thank you so much. We ask, Lord, that you would be a help to us, that we might stand upon these great precious and magnificent promises standing upon the truth of your word standing firm upon it and being strengthened being renewed growing in our knowledge of you and of our Lord Jesus Christ thank you that we might share in the divine nature, in your goodness, in your communicable attributes, escaping the corruption that is in the world by lust until that final day when it will all be rooted out. And so we thank you and praise you through Christ our Lord. Amen. Our ushers are going to come at this time. <clears throat> as they come, I invite you to stand with me as we sing together.